Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Here to talk all things hockey are your hosts, Brad Crisco, Ryan Hanna, and Evan Lobsinger. Why are you so pissy, Evan? <laughs> what? Why are, you, why are you so pissy? <laughs> why are you starting it like this? <laughs> How, how else was I going to start this episode? Oh, because I went to McDonald's and sat there for 20 minutes. And when I got my fucking burger, I took a bite into a half a pickle that I didn't order. <laughs> yeah, that's why I'm pissy. <laughs> Where's the third window for all the shit they fuck up so I can just give it back to them? Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, this is an explicit <laughs> podcast. <laughs> <clears throat> free to use bleep sound effect <laughs> uh, that's a rookie mistake going through drive through i i quit going through the mcdonald's drive through years ago they're just you know how they have those clocks on the inside like uh behind the counter where they work to make sure that they're clearing people through quick enough, the town like the timers. Listen, they did not have enough digits tonight <laughs> for that counter. I think some some point in time within the last like decade or so, they switched how they use them and they see how high they can run up that clock before people actually get out of their car and try to punch through the drive through window. Anti performance bonuses. Yeah. Yeah. It was brutal. Never again. Well, until next week probably. <laughs> no pickles on your burgers? I like normal burgers, not from fast food. I'll put pretty much anything on it. From McDonald's, where their onions are grown from a fine dust, I prefer that to not be on my burger as, as well as their pickles. So I just go straight up ketchup because the rest is disgusting to me. But somehow that makes my order more complicated by having less things on it. A anyways, we'd like to sp thank the sponsor of today's episode, McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> Fix your shit. <laughs> uh, welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. I don't know, not much of a welcome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, here to talk, believe it or not, about Red Wings hockey, the NHL, and things that actually matter to your ears. Uh, for now, I'm Ryan Hanna. <laughs> I'm Brad Grisco. And I'm Evan. Uh, on this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast, we're going to chat with you about uh, the Red Wings games, game that has happened, uh, and some updates in the world of acquisitions, another Smith brother, uh, what's going on in the AHL, Jonathan Bergeron is continuing to make some noise, uh, and we'll discuss a little bit about the new look lines that we've seen now for two consecutive games, which means that it is officially fair play to talk about because... They've existed for more than a hot second. Uh, we'll give some updates from across the NHL, um, some not-so-fun updates in terms of uh, Raymond's bid to be last man in uh, for the All-Star game. Uh, Simon Edvinson got a small bump and, um, well, you know, Marchand and, and Dreisaitl, two of the league's best players, gave us entertainment off the ice recently. Before I do all that, uh, I want to do my uh, episode, my traditional episode call out to the wings money on the board campaign in benefit of the Jamie Daniels foundation. And again, thank you all so much for, uh, through this last campaign, clearing over $5,100, uh, in support of the Jamie Daniels foundation, which brings us to well over 10 grand on the year and means we are well on our way to our goal of $20,000 uh, for the season. So thank you all so very much. Uh, just giving.com slash wings money on the board. And if you want to know more about the campaign, go to wingedwheelpodcast.com slash blog, and you'll find out more about how the campaign benefits the Jamie Daniels Foundation. Uh, and also jamiedanielsfoundation.org if you want to know what that's all about. Um, founded by uh, Ken Daniels and Lisa Daniels Goldman. So thank you all so much again. And uh, I'm not done saying thank you. I'll say thank you a million more times. The uh, the Martin Luther King Day, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Day game always gets me. I always forget that that's a matinee game every single time. Yep. I uh, knew the Red Wings were playing the Sabres that day, and um, I didn't know at what time until I got the notification of game start on my phone while I was at work. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, well, going to have a lot of in-depth coverage on this one. Yep. Watching that recap. Yep. Um, that was a... First of all, Buffalo got dumped on with snow 
much like around where we live. We got about a foot and a half or something like that. And it was in the middle of the workday on a holiday. Um, there wasn't going to be a full crowd there. So it was in Buffalo. And so it was a sleepy game already. And just with how the Red Wings played for the first essentially two periods, I, w- I was certain we were going to walk away with a loss for the Red Wings that was just going to be one of the most unremarkable losses or games of the season. I was like, oh, this one's forgettable. I mean, it still kind of was, but at least it had a positive outcome. In the third period, is that legal? Our Detroit Red Wings? That's what the October Red Wings were doing. Remember when we were talking about, you know, how they were passing the punk test and they were the never give up Red Wings? Like, we stopped saying that around, you know, December 1st. Oh, my God. I forgot we were even saying that. Yeah. The uh, never give up Red Wings was a thing. It feels like three years ago. Yeah. Yeah. It Roughly a, two McDonald's drive throughs It had a bit of that vibe, although the first two periods were way worse than the uh, October Red Wings were. Mm-hmm. Um, but hey, you know, it's it's a positive. Like all that, again, without being able to cover the game in depth, all I taking from that game is this team still gives a shit at least. They do. I was never really concerned about that. I didn't think that they lost their compete. Not with the guys that they have. They have the last couple seasons. Whether or not... Like, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm talking... No, yeah, season. no. But it, with this skid they were on and how poorly they've been playing for the last, you know, seven-ish weeks, I was worried we were getting to that point because the Red Wings have laid a couple absolute piss-poor, low-effort eggs Yeah, the last few weeks. Not every game, but there's there was a few. So it, it's good to know that that's not looking like it's going to be the norm. I don't even think, even if they're sprinkled in a little more than we'd like. I'm going to go so far as to say, and this is you know sticking my neck out to be incredibly wrong, um, but who cares? I'm going to go so far as to say those Red Wings are gone. I think we're at the point in the rebuild where, based on the kind of guys that Steve Eisman wants to bring into this team and has brought onto this team. And the kind of style that he's asked Jeff Blashill to coach and the, and the kind of player Jeff Blashill has asked his players to be, you are only really going to get those high compete, give it your all. We're not going to you know whine and mope about how much we suck players. Like that is, we are getting 110% every shift. Is everyone on this team like that? No. But we'll see them weeded out over time. I genuinely believe that. I think I think the version of the Red Wings that are going to win most games and you know challenge for that wins record that's still a ways away. Like the compete is one thing; you still have to have the the talent and skill. Don't let anyone tell you that just one or the other is what makes a good hockey team. They're stupid and wrong. It's not that easy, but you definitely have to have both. And the Red Wings, I I think, have the first part not hammered down pat, but they're getting there. How many times did they just get down in the dumps and lose like five, six, ten games over the past few seasons? Oh, I thought you were going to say the past few weeks, and the answer was a few. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, Brad, <laughs> it's rude when I go on a whole thing on my soapbox and you tear it out in like six words. <laughs> That's not entirely nice, man. If it makes you feel any better, I chalk those losses up. Uh, less so to do with effort, um, though a contributor, than other issues with the team, roster, organization. <laughs> Interesting. I haven't def- the faintest idea what you could possibly be referring to here. It, it's a lot of things. Tr- truth be told, it's a lot of things. <laughs> One thing that I'll say, and, and we've chatted about previously, is that this team has had just an absolute ringer of a year so far. Ever since New Year's Eve, most of these guys, well, I, I shouldn't say most of these guys, a lot of these guys went through COVID over that break. No, uh, most most of these guys. That's a factual statement. Most of these guys have had COVID at some point. I haven't actually broken it down into who had it when. Yeah. Um, But a lot, like it was a revolving door, the protocol. So they're getting over that. And then from New Year's Eve or New Year's Day, whenever, when they're back at at the rink practicing and playing, they have not had a lot by way of a break or a day off. Also remember, like you, you might see, oh, they played on the fourth and they didn't play again until the eighth. There was a postponed game in there, and they were they've already traveled to the West Coast at that point. This break right now, they had oh no, they had to spend three off days in California. <laughs> well, I mean, you could terrible. Tell, it's terrible. You could tell by the way they played. It was three off days in California. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's not, it's not just the Vegas flu, you know. 
Um, Sunstroke, uh, hangover, all of the above. And lost 1200 bucks in 13 seconds of the craps table, something like that. That's Vegas. Uh, But they've been, they played on the 17th in Buffalo, and then they're not playing again until Friday night. We're recording this on Wednesday night. So that, those three days off, you know, even if they get one or two of them off, that'll be the most rest they've had in 2022, really. So this is a team who's just had a shit start, really, to the year. And so you have to hope now that with these two consecutive wins against Buffalo and with a little bit of rest, they can regain their footing can't expect them to go on the tear like they did in October. I think that was, we even said back then, it's probably not sustainable over a whole season, obviously, but um, we'll see them do hopefully a little bit better than what we've seen from the start of the year till now. Well, December until now. Anyhow, that game, uh, first two and a half periods, the Red Wings did absolutely nothing at all. And then... We had a shorthanded goal, which the Red Wings score now, believe it or not, where Tyler Bertuzzi pushed the puck up to Moritz Sider, who very smartly joined the rush, uh, which is, which can't be discounted. It's one thing to do it just on five on five or the power play, but to do it shorthanded, that is incredible awareness. Uh, joined the rush, made the perfect pass to Nemesnikov, who had the perfect finish uh, against, I think, Aaron Dell was in net to put Detroit on the board. And all of a sudden it was a game. It was a 2-1 game. Uh, Dylan Larkin, the captain, ties it up, and then an OT, who else other than Dylan Larkin, to cap off a dominant OT with that winner. It was like 13 minutes of mayhem after a complete snooze fest of a game. It's good. The, Baby steps. Yeah. Baby uh, steps. After that whole, like, you know, everything that I just described in painstaking detail of how much of a grind they've been through. If you can win a game like that to cap off before a few days off, that's great. That's exactly what you need. Credit to the team, credit to Larkin, credit to Blasio, credit to all of them for pulling it out. And a very prominent theme of the uh, Red Wings season continues. The three goals. Uh, let's recap. Top line, top line, top line. Yeah. Let's talk about those lines. Yeah. It doesn't even matter who's on it. No. <laughs> <laughs> it just mattered that it was the first line. Uh, Coming into the first game against Buffalo, we saw a brand new look Red Wings. And by that, I just mean the top two lines were shuffled. Obviously, offense had been stagnant. The team wasn't doing much by way of scoring or a lot of other things. So we saw a top line of Vlad Nemesnikov, Dylan Larkin, and Lucas Raymond in a second line of Fabry Suduter. <laughs> You're close. Close. Fabry uh, Suter and Bertuzzi. Uh, Wordle just rejected that. <laughs> yes, it certainly did. I got today's in two. Two. Yeah, my first it. guess was very lucky. I got it in three, and my first guess was, like, way off. Mm. I had one letter on the first one, and I got it in three. Have you ever done it, Evan? Yeah, I got it today. I think I was in two today. Oh, my God. I think I got I think I think got the first three letters in position. <sighs> so I was like, all right. Ow. I didn't. I did, it, I did it with, like, my eyes half closed. Too. I had the... That was it. Get wrecked. Anyhow. Hey, still got it in three. The Guelph connection on the second line, and then Nemesnikov rewarded uh, with that first line play. What are your thoughts? Um, Sure. Like, no, honestly, I want to get in depth on this, but it was so bad they had to try something. They did. They had to try something. This makes as much sense as any other combination was going to. Fine. Like, Nemesnikov, based on... Merritt was probably the guy who earned the promotion to the top line. So I'm okay with it. And he's just good enough to be able to hang with, with them is probably the right word. Mm -hmm. Uh, He's not going to be the driver on that line, but I don't think he'll slow them down. Obviously he won't be as effective as Bertuzzi was, but you know what? If Bertuzzi can go down to the second line and drive a line for a little bit, not that Suter and Fabry are bad, but neither of those guys are line drivers and, you know, honestly, Bertuzzi really isn't either, but he's more likely to be than either of those two. Yeah. So, sure. Like, I'd love to be able to give a more nuanced answer here, but um, this just, I chalk up to shit's broke, try anything. I had some concerns. Like, I agree. I think the team did have to try this, but I did have some concerns because I remember times in the past where Tyler Bertuzzi was moved down the lineup. Obviously, one of the Red Wings' best players and has gotten better every year. He's been healthy. Um, But they've moved him down the lineup in the past to try to spark other lines. And I didn't – 
see a lot there. And I don't think that was a Bertuzzi thing. I think that was the other Lions thing. And it's it's got to be shitty playing with Dylan Larkin and then going to play with anyone else on the team. The textbook example of what we talk about when we say a first line player, but not a line driver. Yeah. Um, but this time, I think things worked out. You're right. Nemesnikov is not a first line player, plain and simple. And that's not a knock on him. But in terms of guys who should who should be rewarded with that, I think if you had to pick one, he's up there, if not the best candidate for it. And yeah, he has two line drivers with him. Larkin and Raymond will control and generate play. And if Nemesnikov can be the piano, I hate, I hate calling back to this, the piano puller or just be in the right spot or just do the right thing, which he's been doing all year. Like it's just fundamentals. It's not, it's definitely. Let's call him a honey badger. Yeah. Why not? A honey badger. A guy who's uh, who who gives one ten isn't untalented, but isn't the the top line player. They all get the label honey badger. Yeah. Um. He's he's not going to be Tyler Bertuzzi, but it's not a massive downgrade like we've seen in the past, where they would put like Jonathan Erickson on the first line or something ridiculous. Not actually Jonathan Erickson. Please stay away from my DMs. It was a joke. At Ryan Hanna WWP. <laughs> um. No. It, it's it's been good and. I think Nemesnikov, all I can see when he goes on the first line, all I can see whenever he buries a good, like a, a solid goal, he's no longer an empty net scorer. He scores on actual goalies this year is what do they do with him at the deadline? It is so tough because this guy just loves being with the Red Wings. He's actually really productive for the Red Wings. The irony of this all is him being on the first line increases his chances of being <laughs> traded pump up his stats just before the deadline and yeah. maybe some team coughs up a second round pick or a decent prospect for him. it's not a bad strategy too like this it should be said that might be part of it right they might be doing this to showcase Nemestikov. we're getting there or within you know weeks of the deadline i can't remember the actual date march something or other yeah sounds sounds right but you know you want the rest of the league to see him Stick them on that first line, pump up the numbers even more. It's not bad. Well, unfortunately, no one is watching in Buffalo, so. Right, yeah. <laughs> what <did> Ken, <laughs> it, Ken wasn't making fun of the crowd. It's It was a snow day. No one was there. It was in the middle. It was a matinee game. But uh, Mick said something like, um, these guys came out and they got the message uh, from the coach, blah, blah, blah. They're having a much better game than the last game. And Ken goes, well, they sure didn't get it from the fans. <laughs> didn't... Um... Didn't New Jersey do a thing on a snow day where they just let all the school kids come to the matinee game? Uh, that sounds awesome. I think every team should do that. If there's a snow day, you should just let everyone in. Yeah. G- give them all half price hot dogs or something. Hell yeah. Well, no, everybody in Buffalo is still drunk, passed out outside the Ralph. <laughs> so and the, snow, I, the snowstorm just kind of buried them. They'll, they're waking up like right around now probably everything i know about the buffalo bills i've learned against my my will <laughs> yes it's forced oh learning. no i may have taught you a lot of things about the buffalo bills but being the drunkest fan base in the league you definitely knew before i got here i know i know the table stuff and i know the tailgating stuff and i don't know the tailgate that's is all you need to know yeah that's actually that's the summer that's enough anyhow uh that's the red wings they don't have a game again until friday uh against dallas and then Saturday against Nashville before our next episode on Sunday. So Dallas games are always fun because I'm like, is someone going to fight Jamie Ben? Probably not. But I like Prashant's idea of a Smith Smith Witkowski line. And let's talk about that for a second. Uh, the Red Wings today claimed off waivers from the Tampa Bay Lightning uh, centerman, but more importantly, Jamel Smith. Indeed, Giovanni's older brother. Is this exciting for reasons beyond it's just cool that Giovanni gets to play with his brother and that's always an awesome thing to see? No, that, that's the that's the summary of it. That's the whole thesis. But it is cool. Oh, it is. It is super cool. It's awesome. Hopefully it boosts morale around the team because obviously Giovanni is a popular player on the team. So when good things happen to good guys, it's going to you know raise everybody's spirits, especially coming off back-to-back wins. Um, so yeah, and he's... a uh, usable bottom line player. I mean, he is his brother, except I think he's a better skater. Not that I have a mega in-depth scouting report. Um, Everything I know about Jamel Smith is basically Carter Rowney, but younger. Mm -hmm. So sure. You're going to, I think you're going to see 
depth scratch AHL. It, it's much the same like roster profile as Giovanni as to where he'll fit in. I don't think it'll be AHL or else they probably wouldn't have claimed him because if they want to send him, he's got to go through waivers again. But not not out of the realm of possibility. But mm-hmm. uh, no, he's going to slide in right next to Carter Rowney on that. Hey, you might play, you might not. When you get out there, kill some penalties, you know, try to not die and uh ha- have some fun uh, that's what that's what he's going to be here for but yeah because he's playing with his brother maybe the rings are hoping to get that that little power boost that guys get in situations like this every once in a while might and it might work for giovanni as well we absolutely need to see a, a smith smith line i don't care who's in the middle or maybe uh, it's jamel in the middle but we need yeah. to see a smith smith line oh it'll happen at some point this year because they're literally both fourth line players so just by sheer odds and numbers, it, it'll happen at some point. That is this year's Svechnikov Bowl. Something that we care about for no reason other than emotional. It matters none in the universe. And when it's like it happens and it's gone, everyone's like, remember when you made a big deal about that? We're like, yeah, and we'll do it again. That's it. This is again. It's going to be the game against Friday. Giovanni's going to smite, uh, fight Jamie Ben in the first period. Jamel's going to fight him in the second. And then Giovanni's going to fight him again in the third. <laughs> <laughs> Giovanni Smith smites Jamie Ben. I'll take that. That works as well. <laughs> Just brings lightning down from the ceiling like Thor. The roof of the LCA does look like it could handle that. So yeah, honestly, we'll be fine. The the little Caesar's pizza guy on the roof will just actually power it up. Yeah, it'll come from the uh, staff holding the pizza. Exactly. Why do you think that's up there? It's a lightning rod. It's not actually a staff. The LCA marketing exec listening to this, write that down. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> no free ads. I mean. we're little caesars mcdonald's what fast food chain are we hawking next none no that's it (laughs) we can only do so many fast food chains yeah i burger king anyways (laughs) um that is uh that's the red wings i was a little bit surprised to see the smith claim but yeah like you said low impact not going to move the needle hockey wise but it's cool and uh this team needs cool and fun right now things that are extremely cool and do make an impact hockey wise Jonathan Bergeron on an absolute tear. This guy has taken his adjustment period to the AHL. He's been adjusted and oh man, is he making an impact now? I'm going to quote Eiserman season on Twitter here. He's the one who actually looked up the stat. Bergeron um, has 27 points in 30 games. And the fun thing about that uh, is that he had only one point in his first five and 26 in his last 25. So very obviously getting used to that North American ice, Brand new team, brand new line line mates that, you know, moving across the world and has now proceeded to be the player we thought Jonathan Bergen would be in Grand Rapids. Yeah, who would have thought that um, the highlight of his week wasn't shattering that guy's ankles in overtime? I mean, that's still the highlight, but it wasn't his best game of the two. It was fun. Yeah, which, by the way, uh, shout out to at katie chicken 69 on twitter who actually made that dumb tiktok i suggested last week last episode after burger and shattered that guy's ankles and it is glorious um but yeah four assists was his uh encore to that goal i mean i don't think i was expecting burger to be this good in grand rapids this year i think this is another case of exceeding expectations because he is only 21 21 21 so he's not that old um and he did miss a lot of development time with injuries i think people do forget that and he is an undersized player coming into a more physical league on smaller ice like i was expecting a rough transition um which did happen i just assumed it would be more than five games so it, it's been all sunshine and roses since which is good because you know we when talking in context of the draft and and drafting versus need versus best player available, we've kind of shifted the conversation in the last couple of years to not necessarily positionality, more what type of player are the Red Wings missing? Mm-hmm. The Red Wings still don't have that playmaker, that Nick Backstrom, those guys who literally exist to generate assists but have enough skill to chip in a goal if they feel bored one night. Oh, I was just going to say – because you've heard of Lucas Raymond, but you're saying guys who are that is they're purely what they are doing. On the that ice. is that is their calling card. That is their hallmark. Yeah, that is Jonathan Bergeron. Like again, you. I'm not saying he can't score. We saw that goal set, but like you look at his stats from Europe, he was not lighting the lamp a lot, but he was still having huge points, and it was primarily assists. So the fact he can do that with 
it's called Space Spade, lesser talent in the AHL. And in a year where he's adjusting to a brand new style of hockey, that is unbelievably encouraging. And again, if he does make the Red Wings next year, hey, here's our solution on the left half wall. Problem solved. If for people who have been listening for a while, you'll know this, but for, for any listeners who have come in since Jonathan Bergen's been drafted, so he was drafted 33rd overall, so that's the top of the second round. For all intents and purposes, you know, a late first round pick in 2018. Uh, and he was a player who we were pretty excited about. I remember we had talked about him before the draft, and, and he was one of the guys we were really high on on the board um, at that position or like at that spot in the draft. The next season in Sheleftia, he played 16 games due to injury, missed a shit ton of hockey. The season after that, 2019 2020, he played 24 games, missed a ton of hockey. And we were saying, like, look, his talent's not gone, but those are formative years. Like, that is a ton of ma- – like, a, a ton of learning in the pro game and as you prepare to try to make the NHL that happens in those years. And if you think, oh, like, you guys just said he's 20 years old or 21 years old, like, he'll be 22 by the time he makes the Red Wings if that's next year. Like, that's not as young as we've seen other players. Yeah, the guy missed time, a lot of time. And it's not just about delaying things. At some point – is do you miss the bus? Does does that window of opportunity fly past you because you're out with a back injury or back, out with a knee injury or whatever else it ailed Jonathan Bergeron? And we were bummed. I was I would probably would have put it at less than fifty percent that he recovered because it just doesn't happen. I shouldn't say it doesn't happen terribly often. It's hard for players to come back from that and seem like the player they were from the start. So to see Jonathan Bergeron doing what he's doing now after missing a ton of hockey and you know a lot of like important games over in the SHL i think it's it's a massive win for the red wings and it's a massive like retroactive win for the draft yeah you missed the one season where he did in the SHL where he finally played yeah, yeah, a full yeah. season and challenged for the scoring title the entire year yeah 2021 or 2020 <laughs> 2021 which is last season he uh, in 49 games he put up 45 points so yeah that was his comeback year his comeback didn't start in grand rapids it did still start in the SHL he just hung around there longer than maybe we would have expected. Had it not been for the injuries, and yeah, he's thriving. Don't expect him to put up this type of numbers in the NHL, but... But you know, maybe. But maybe. 75% of this would be fantastic. All of their fan bases who overhype their prospects and just get way too high in it, and they end up being disappointed, and then they, they're they bummed out about something that was never going to happen, they're insane, and it never works out for them. But it might work for us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you've talked a little bit about the kind of player Jonathan Bergeron is. Let's expand on that, and let's also talk timeline and possibility of him making the Red Wings. Hi. Um, he's going to be 22. Mm-hmm. He's excelling at the own, the level one below the NHL. There's only one step he can make from this point. That is the Red Wings. So, you know, obviously if he goes in to camp, next year and shits his pants okay yeah then you go back to the hl but um i think if he finishes off the year which is worth noting we're only halfway through yeah there's a lot of time for this to go off the rails and he has not played a full season really anywhere except for last year and uh the shl but even the shl season considerably shorter uh because of covid and just in general versus the hl and the nhl uh but if he finishes even 80 percent of where he's at right now in the HL, I think he's probably more likely than not to spend, I'll say a majority of the season with the Red Wings next year. You think we see him? At, oh, I think it's, it's might be likely that we see him this season. If there's a lot of trades or, you know, a massive amount of injury. There's a, a lot that goes into it. Are the Red Wings playing meaningful games in, you know, late March, April? Um, and are the Griffins playing right. meaningful games in the same timeline because what is going to be more valuable for his development playing nine throwaway games in April for the Red Wings or playing nine hey we're contending for a playoff spot or we're contending for you know meaningful seeding in the playoffs with Grand Rapids and not only that I don't think like the ELC slide also doesn't apply to him either so it's no. not it's just like nine's an arbitrary number there but that's a good point with Grand Rapids 
yeah, I, I you don't want to rob them of that opportunity, especially because he's among the league le- or the team leaders in points with um, Taro Hirose, who's just a couple points ahead of him at 29 points in 31 games. So, hey, Grand Rapids needs that run as well, and his success there will translate into better, you know, development uh, at the Red Wings level. Not that you know NHL reps are bad, but like you said, Brad, maybe there isn't a point if you know he's going to be at camp and be on the team in you know a few short months after that. His role on the Red Wings, his ceiling, his likely landing spot, what's his path going to be? Um, next year, if it goes well, third line winger, second power play unit. Um, his ultimate ceiling, if he gets close to it, probably second line winger, runs the half wall on the first power play unit. Him on that half wall, okay. He's got soft hands, this guy. Him on that half wall on the power play unit, you spread out Raymond cider on the point, you stick Larkin in there, stick Bertuzzi, whoever else. Obviously you're not going to overload with all of those guys unless every power play is a six on three, but it does add a lot of weapons where it's much, much, much harder to just purely ISO Lucas Raymond and shut his game down or purely ISO Dylan Larkin and make sure he can't dish out the puck. So this is, might be getting way too in the weeds, but as we do, when it comes to, passing and playmaking ability Bergeron special it's probably the only part of his game that you can classify as truly special but it's special and don't get me wrong I'm not demeaning the rest of his game he's still very good at a lot of other things but like like we talked about earlier this is his calling card this is his thing when you set him up on the half wall on a power play he's not going to be a, much of a shooting threat and most people know that so you need to build that power play very specifically around him. And unfortunately, Raymond Insider won't fit on that because he needs to have a lefty on the point and a lefty in the slot because he needs to have those one-time options to be able to make the quick plays. Now, you could put Raymond on the far side of the ice if you want him shooting off his strong side, which isn't a terrible idea. But then yeah. you're, you're taking away all one-time options on the half wall, which is probably not a good recipe. But I don't hate that because the Red Wings' second power play unit has been tragic, and they could— They don't have one. They could, Yeah, no, and they could use a boost. So you could have, you know, Larkin on the right half on the first power play unit setting up, you know, the right-handed shots, Raymond, Sider, and Hronik, however you want to break that down. And Bergeron on the second unit setting up Zadina, Edvinson, Fabry, pick whatever you want, right? Just— you know, it could be whoever, just, mm-hmm. but it's the one thing I don't think the Red Wings have done enough in terms of utilizing strengths. And um, if you get Berggren, like, not that he is Thomas Vanek or will have the strengths or deficiencies of Vanek, but he's a guy you definitely have to carefully utilize. Because if you throw him right now in Philip Zadina's spot with Michael Rasmussen, he, he will, the polite way to do this, not perform well. <laughs> What do you mean, Brad? Um, <laughs> scored a breakaway goal. Yeah, so it, it is tricky, but if deployed correctly, he could be very valuable to this team right out of the gate. But if deployed incorrectly, he's going to be invisible. So what do you think? A third line of like Shane Wright, Philip Zadina, Jonathan Bergeron? Uh, I was just going to put him with um, Zadina and Verona, and we'll teach one of them to play center. Oh, okay. Yeah. And Shane Wright's... Not, not, not overthinking. Shane Wright's on the second line, my guy. Got Keep it. up. Keep uh, up. I thought maybe we'd bump him back to left defense. We're going to have to start those prospect profiles soon. <laughs> Evan's joke is no longer a meme. We're, we're no. about there. <laughs> we have to give our friend Tony a call. Or Will. Or both. Um, I'm still on Shane Wright train, I believe. Oh, no. Shane Wright's the guy. But, like, you know, you got you to gotta have your guy yeah. beyond one. The more I dive into this... Uh, I feel like I'm going to land on Savoy on this one. You remember just now when I said, I believe about Shane, Wright? Mm-hmm. I don't know why I said that. That's a lie. The Red Wings aren't going to come close to first overall. Not even a little bit. This is our year in the lottery. No, I couldn't say it with the street face. <laughs> yeah, this is our year. We'll win the lottery. Move up to six. Yeah. <laughs> That's what's going to happen. <laughs> the prophecy has been foretold. Uh, we no, are... What is it? The prophecy is self-fulfilling. Something like that. The prophecy is bullshit. That's what it is. No, it's come to fruition every goddamn year. The prophecy is think of the worst way you could be sad, and that's what's going to happen this lottery. But the Red Wings will make the most of it. Uh, before we talk more 
about Red Wings hockey, we are going to tell you that the uh, this episode of the Winged Wheel podcast is proudly brought to you by the FanDuel Sportsbook, a sponsor that gives hockey fans what we really need, even more excitement. Uh, they're America's number one sportsbook for so many reasons. Uh, ease of use, from registration to deposit and finding your ideal bet, and quick withdrawals when you win. FanDuel pays your winnings back in as little as 24 hours. They also have great odds boosts and specials uh, every day with some big super boosts each weekend. Now listen to this. FanDuel is letting you place your first bet risk-free up to $1,000 back. No strings attached. If you win, you keep the cash, and if you lose, you'll get up to $1,000 back in site credit. Uh, download the spit for the FanDuel Sportsbook app to get started with that risk-free bet of up to $1,000 today. And be sure to sign up with promo code WWP so they know the Winged Wheel podcast sent you. That's FanDuel Sportsbook promo code WWP. You must be 21 and older and present in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Illinois, West Virginia, Indiana, Colorado, Iowa, Tennessee, Virginia, or Michigan. First online real money wager only. Site credit is non-withdrawable and expires in 14 days. Restrictions apply. See sportsbook.fanduel.com for details. If you have a gambling problem, call 1-800-522-4700 in Colorado, 1-800-BETS-OFF in Iowa, 1-800-9-WITH-IT in Indiana, 1-800-GAMBLER in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Illinois, and Virginia, Tennessee Redline 1-800-889-9789. 1-800-GAMBLER.net in West Virginia, or call 1-800-270-7117 in Michigan. Last men in. Lucas Raymond, not successful, unfortunately. God, enjoy your week in Cabo. Yeah, for real. Well, if he can go. Uh, he's he's rich and famous. Of course he can go. Um, <laughs> He deserves it. Although, we're, we're still at the phase with injuries, right? Like, injuries still have to come. NHL, especially seasoned vets, are going to find every single excuse they can to not go. Guys who have had... I mean, the kind of season, the kind of 2022s that the Red Wings have had are going to want that break. And we have now had rescheduled games stuck in the calendar. Um, so I think there's still an opportunity. I think Moritz Sider will be among one of the first defensemen called for the Atlantic Division. And Lucas Raymond can't be too far off for forwards to be called up. So it still might happen. But as of right now, it's just Dylan Larkin. Can't be really mad that it was Stamkos, though. He's deserving of it this year. I can be mad. Are you? No. Yeah, I was going to say, you can't. But I can be. I'm just not. Like, it's Stammer. He's been great. Like you've said in the past, he probably would have been a uh, an Olympian as well, which you got to be bummed out for that guy. He's never been. I'm a little rattled, though, because um, had this been an appropriate timeline for voting where people could have got into it, the three players from other divisions that I said we should have formed alliances with, they got in. Every one of them. We were betrayed. Yeah, we were. It was the NHL. They're like, hey, here's this. No, great- not Kadri. We didn't have Colorado because you. I forgot he got in. Although, good that he got voted in. Yeah, he was the most deserving of that. Very well deserving. Um, it, is, it was funny. And you talked about this last episode. But, hey, here's this really cool thing with the All-Star game. And, oh, there's votes for last men in. And you're like, oh, yeah, that's pretty cool. I, I don't mind that format at all. We voted for the captains. Now we get some control over who that last guy is. And it's over. Right. We had six hours to do that. When is the All-Star game again? Who cares? Yeah. It's probably like two months away. NHL. No, it's like a month away. All-Star game. It's uh, in February. I just can't remember. February 5th. Oh, okay. So it's... it's not... No, no. It still didn't need to end in like a day. Oh, it's on Crystal's birthday. I definitely won't be watching it. Oh. Might watch the skills competition, though, because uh, isn't Zegris going in for the <laughs> breakaway challenge? I said, Crystal, it's my wife's birthday. I'm definitely not watching it. Oh, except for this one thing that I'm definitely going to watch. The skills competition that's the day before. The skills competition that's six hours long and no one knows what's happening. Oh, no, I'm just watching the 10 minutes where Zegers is doing tricks and that's it. So in addition to the last men in, they did confirm that individual players will be invited to parts of the skills competition. And the one that was highlighted was Zegers is invited to the breakaway competition, which... Definitely wasn't in their plans, but enough people made noise about it where they were like, why aren't you doing this, idiots? And they're like, oh, my God, they're right. What a brilliant idea that no one's ever thought of. Yes. Well, they stuck it in. Um, Can't believe other sports leagues aren't doing this. <laughs> the NHL is like, all right, next up, bread, but pre-sliced. <laughs> <laughs> Milk with cocoa. Tickets you can scan on your phone. Oh, hey, hey, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Not my NHL. Pucks um, that glow. Don't I don't I don't get the glowing puck. They thing. should do a Nickelodeon NHL game. Oh my, oh my god! Yeah. I watched the 49ers Cowboys game with the Nickelodeon. Like, I am angry the NHL doesn't do this. The- I I am the least. I'm not surprised in the least they don't do that. Oh, of course they won't. 
I, NHL in five years will do it and be like, we thought of this great idea. It's called a Nickelodeon game. <laughs> Crystal and Mika got home with like five minutes left in the fourth quarter of that game. And Mika thought it was the coolest shit she's ever seen in her life. Like, if you want to do that to like manipulate kids into liking your sport, it works. Do it. Who does she vote for MVP? Josh Allen. The wrong. You're supposed to pick the loser. <laughs> Dummy. Tell her she's wrong. Who was that? It was uh, Mitchie the first year. Yeah, Mitchie Biscuits got it once. And then who was it this year? Uh, da, da, da. Oh, man, that Dak play. I just remembered that. Well, that, that wasn't Dak. That was that was definitely a design play call. Like, he, there was no hesitation in the pocket. He got that ball and took off. Someone pointed at him. Yeah, I, d- I actually did see that. Yeah, that was stupid. The most bizarre th- and I don't watch football at all. I'm like, this is the most bizarre play call of all time. And, and they're trying to blame the ref. And I don't know how old that ref is. I just assume he's like 82, and he was hauling ass upfield trying to get there. It's not his fault. Speaking no. of ass, he's got to get around guys who's got butts <laughs> the size of dump trucks. He's got a couple of Dylan Larkins on the line. Oh, he's got to get around. He him. pushed his way through there, though. He got he made it work. Those he are just, big boys. Yeah. <laughs> he just didn't have enough time. Anyhow, um, the the notable All Star game. You know, guy who's coming in is going to be Trevor Zegras for the breakaway challenge. I hope they bring in other players for other stuff yeah lucas raymond might be known not known as just a pure goal score only but bring but bring him in for the shooting competition there's just stuff where you should be bringing in these young guys especially the young guys i think to showcase all across brad marchand should live tweet it the whole event 100 percent, he should from the nhl's account what's the what would be the nhl's version of the manning cast would brad marchand be on it What's a Manning cast? Is that the thing with Eli and Pete? Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they bring on random yeah. people. And they commentate the game. They flip the bird and they swear. Uh, I mean, there's got to be enough retired NHL players who could definitely do that. Yeah. They'll get Bissonette. Like, if, if they ever do it, Bissonette will be on it. He's like the face of that, like, ex NHLer who's now a commentator. I'm just trying to think. But, like, the Mannings were. People like, who are also. Inter- they have to be interesting. No, oh, and every hockey player is excluded. Moving on. Yeah. Yeah. Bunch of... <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, that doesn't work at all. <laughs> bunch of plain bread, milk, toast. Robin Leonard milk. and Brad Marchand. We'll start with that. Brad Marchand and... Who does Brad Marchand hate the most? Um, Vincent Trocek? Those two. <laughs> <laughs> Rod Brindamore and that ref he yelled at. Did you, you guys saw the thing about Brad Marchand taking screenshots of Vincent Trocek's hockey DB, right? No. Yeah, he t- said something about how Trocek Trocek was calling him a rat, and he's like, it's he's like it's com- like comparing a Prius to a Ferrari or something. And then he put his screenshot of his stats on hockey DB and then Trocek's. <laughs> this is what I'm talking about when I when I say players would care about like. The shooting competition or, like, the fastest skater, like, make it a challenge thing. Shit like that is exactly how you know they would care about it. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, was it Elite Prospects? It was like, this is the profile that was looked at the most this last month. Half of those visits are from the players themselves. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was funny. Uh, I thought for sure you guys had seen that. Yeah. I saw Yeah, the, the players are tuned into everything. So, hello to every NHL player listening to us right now. Yeah. We know you're there. All zero of you. Uh, Brad Marchand's tweet was it Carolina had a funny tweet in response to the Lambo thing. L is for Lamborghini. Right, because they clocked. Did you see his reply to that? Oh my god. <laughs> Twitter, that, that reply goes right in the Twitter Hall of Fame. I'm not I am I'm not the kind of person where I like I don't like that player, nothing they do is ever good or funny. But I will hardly be the first person to give Brad Marchand credit. That is a Hall of Fame tweet. You need to let people in on it carolina responded uh or, or tweeted after they beat uh boston 7-1 today and in response to the whole lamborghini prius thing they said l is for lamborghini and brad marsh <laughs> replied you're still the reason why we paid 20 percent in escrow <laughs> <laughs> oh my god that's that is so good it's almost too good <laughs> and if you need an explanation there very very simplified version uh the NHL engages in revenue sharing, which means teams get more or less equal cuts of the pie, regardless of their revenue. Uh, and so teams with less gate revenue are uh, heavily you know, lifted by this. So teams with lower attendance, et cetera, et cetera. And so Brad Marchand is telling them they have no fans. And then the 
the reply back from the Hurricanes account was funny. It was LOL. We just tweet Brad. <laughs> <laughs> that was a that was the uh, way of hey, admitting defeat without saying it. It there was they weren't going to walk away from that one. Winners. No. He came out with a haymaker of all haymakers, but yeah, that was a nice way to cap it off. Yeah, they come out with a with a jab. He comes out with a rocket launcher. <laughs> what was that old? Uh, Jim Jeffries line, they brought guns to a drone fight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I am there are there's a big sentiment to like want more personality from players and want to get more of their personal lives. And unfortunately, I think because everything's been so politically charged, it's like, oh, you want to get more know more about this player? Here's their like political views or something like that. It's like I don't No, no, we don't care. want that. We don't want that. I want to see more of this. Yeah, me too. Like I love it. I love he's the biggest heel in the NHL and I 100%. absolutely love it. Because w- he's so good too. He's he can do whatever he wants. Exactly. I will be seething, seething the next time Brad Marchand pulls some shit against the Red Wings, and I will say no nice words about him the podcast after. Yeah. And it's perfect. That's what the NHL will buy tickets. People are going to buy tickets to go watch him, and they're going to want Giovanni Smith to fight him, and they're going to scream their voices hoarse until uh, watching the fight. I have the most fight. fair weather views on Brad Marchand of all time. I, I hate him when he does dumb shit, but when he says things like this, I just laugh because it's not directed at, at the Red Wings. Yeah. <laughs> I love Brad Marchand because of how much I hate him and the fact that he leans into it. Yeah. Yes. That's what makes him good. The NHL needs way more players like that everybody hates him he knows it and he loves to play it up he'd be like the perfect wwe supervillain. honestly he's the type of guy who like if he doesn't have something going in again in the game he'll start some start some stuff to get himself going and i'll absolutely love it it's the Boston thing because I Zidane Chara. He's not Brad Marchand type player, but Zidane Chara, like when he plays you, you're like you're so annoying. You'll start some shit and then you'll like hold someone at arm's length and like laugh, and you'll walk away with um, even minors. Like the, you, he won't get the extra penalty, and you're like, how does he get away with it? But it's it, it's good entertainment. I think fair weather is fine. Fair weather means you're you're going with the flow of how entertaining the sport is. That's totally okay. Yeah. I, you love to hate someone. Don't feel bad about hating another. And if it was towards the Red Wings, I'd hate Brad Marchand, but I'd still love that I'm engaged and I there's, yeah. the, there's the passion. Something like uh, online discourse often, like a, a conversation will like between like a Red Wings fan and a Leafs fan, will, or let's say like Boston or Montreal fan, like those – there will be a comment thread and it'll eventually devolve into, oh, but you guys got a good team. You have a lot to look forward to. Like, cheers – I'm like, yeah, that's. I don't get that good. far, but no. I, I trust you. Just like, it's okay to hate the other, like, hate the other teams, hate them. That's part of the sport. It's fun. Yeah, get right, like, get riled up. If anyone tells you that you're taking it too seriously, yeah, they're probably right. But there's probably shit in their life they take too seriously. Life's short. Hate yeah. other teams. Life's short. Rip on them the Maple Leafs. Yeah, everybody gets pissy once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> should we give that a quick second? Oh, absolutely, we should. Jim Matheson and Leon Dreisaitl squaring off in that press conference where it ended up with Jim Matheson calling Dreisaitl pissy <laughs> and Dreisaitl is just essentially like he said oh you know everything telling him he hates him and he thinks he sucks it is not yeah there there's a conversation here about you know how should media be treated or how should media treat players blah 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 I think it's purely funny I think it's a hey, if you're going to step into the kitchen, expect some heat. Like, yeah, from both of them. You're both adults. Yeah, like, yeah. It's not like he punched a, a child asking for a puck in yeah. warm-ups. Yeah, the reporter asked three questions trying to lead Dreisaitl to the answer he wanted, and Dreisaitl wasn't having it. In Dreisaitl's defense, the first answer he gave was like, a respectful, reasonable answer. Like, you know, a typical hockey player answer, a whole lot of words to say nothing. Um, but then it just, the issue kept getting pushed and, you know, Hey, good reporters should push the issue because that's, you know, how you get quotes and re- reactions and all that. Like, got a quote. <laughs> yeah, you want to go to a point, like once you get the reaction, maybe don't call them names or <laughs> I think he was trying to lead the witness a little bit a and, thousand and be like, was. can you name one specific thing that's really bad on this team? And they've just went through all the crap with the coach putting the, the goalies under the bus and the goalies putting everybody else under the bus. It's like read the room a little bit, right? 
I'm <clears throat> I have the utmost respect for, you know, people who have been doing this for years. I'm not a writer, I'm not a journalist, I'm not a reporter. I'm sure the first question I would ever ask would be so blatantly terrible. My foot would be so Is far down my mouth. A hot dog a sandwich. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which I think you've asked both Ron McLean and Maybe you were about to ask Nicholas Lidstrom and Brad and I stopped you. I think that's how that one went. <laughs> he definitely was going to. Yeah. It's for science. Yeah. And I personally am not a fan. Like Edmonton media in general, and this has been a sentiment that's been discussed over the past few days. They have just, I think, in my mind, sheltered that whole administration, whoever upper management has been. The Holland era, the before the Chirelli era, Kevin Lowe, all those guys, they've just sheltered them. And they're just holdovers from Edmonton's dominant days. And I think they have a narrative that they often run with that's anti-Edmonton player, and it never holds Edmonton management accountable. And that's why I don't really love the line of questioning or really the stories, you know, that Matheson was talking about there. But for me, I like that's I don't care. Then I can just not click on the stories and not read. In terms of that press conference. I would have never known it happened otherwise. Matheson, you know, he he's not liked by the players, not liked by Drysaddle. Drysaddle decided to dish it out. Matheson decided he had to stand up for himself. And unfortunately for Matheson, he's not liked by ninety percent of Twitter. So, <laughs> oh my! So that guy, he got the like. Don't get me wrong, I don't love what he did there, but man, was that reaction to him like. You know, I, if you're gonna poor guy, I still, I no, I still think if you're gonna dish that out, yeah, it came your way, and yeah, you yeah. dished it back. But I, if you're gonna be out there, that's that's what you have to hold yourself. Uh, that's what you have to kind of expect. You you can't call an NHL player pissy in a press conference and not well, expect that heat. It's just a microcosm of like what you were alluding to with Edmonton media in general. Edmonton media in Canada media circles is the weirdest damn thing. If Vancouver or Toronto lose, like two games in a row every media member is ready to burn down the team's arena and fire everybody into the sun in edmonton it's the opposite it's the coaching and the management and the ownership can do nothing wrong and it's always just an effort thing with the players it's been 12 13 14 15 20 years of ah the players just aren't trying and the fan base is getting sick of that narrative which is i think why matheson got piled on so hard on Twitter. Now he is a culprit of it, but I think he became the poster child for the problem yes. <laughs> because of this. Um, and uh, yeah, like you said, Hey, you want to piss off a player to get a reaction, to get a quote. I personally wouldn't do that, but I, I get it. Especially when hockey players give lame ass boring answers all the time. Sure. You got to push the issue a little bit, but when you've crossed that line, Either stop or, like you said, uh, brace for impact. <laughs> I, I didn't even think Drysaddle, like, really, he could have, there could have been a top 10 all time soundbite there, but he handled it, I'll say, with grace, per se. They both dished it out. I don't know if grace is the word, but yeah, he didn't, he didn't fire back. Yeah. Which was, yeah. I think, I think Drysaddle, he was smirking. He knew he got to. <laughs> He's like, I asked you a question. He's like, I gave you an answer. Yeah, right away. <laughs> Boom, roasted. That's that rare occasion where you play out the fight in the shower before it actually happens, yeah. so you're prepped. Oh, isn't that a sweet oh, feeling when you do God. that? Drysaddle was just in the shower after that shadow boxing, like Rocky yeah. at the top of the stairs. Drysaddle's like, I can either say my GM has not equipped this team with proper depth, defense, or goaltending, or I can just fire it's back. It's me and Connor the out set. there. That's it. <laughs> what the hell do you expect us to do? We can't play the whole game. Yeah. Uh, Why are you angry, Leon? Yeah, I'm angry. Why? My back hurts. Why? Carrying 17 of these 18 guys on my back for the last three years. Oh, man. I don't think anything needs to change because this is funny to me and I want it to continue. <laughs> I want more of it. Um. By the way, it was Dak Prescott who won MVP. Nickelodeon. Aww. Valuable player. Is that what it stands for? I... Um. Yeah, Nickelodeon valuable player. So stupid. We should do it. I love that. <laughs> yeah, that's hysterical. And then we show up to the LCA and just dump slime on someone. How's this go? Oh, if we can bring back sliming, that's great. I'm here for it. We're going to, before this goes down a path, we don't want it to. Uh, we're going to jump into overtime here on the Winged Wheel podcast. Uh, and on this midweek episode, overtime is brought to you by our Patreon supporters exclusively. Uh, they're the heartbeat of the show. And they're the reasons we are able to go out and go off the rails like we do. How? I don't know, but it's their fault. 
Just kidding. Winged Wheel pot, hmm, Patreon.com slash Winged Wheel Podcast. If you want to help support the show and get access to uh, exclusive content like over full overtime uh, for every episode we post it after where everyone's questions and comments get answered. Uh, question from Max $1 million says, what is a memory you have of Chris Pronger from uh, back in his playing days? Can be a good one, a bad one, or just something that sticks out? Consistently losing to the Red Wings. Didn't he, in when Anaheim played Ottawa in the finals, didn't he injure somebody? Wasn't it, was it Chris Neal when he was on an absolute heater? It was like the most blatant injury of all time. Do you remember the that? The only thing I don't believe about that story is Chris Neal being on an absolute heater. He may have been the only player who was doing any anything productive, so maybe heater was a little bit strong. He got a one-game suspension for that, I believe. It was an elbow. Yeah. Yeah. My uh, favorite Chris Pronger memory that doesn't involve him losing to the Red Wings is absolutely when Adam Burrish called him an idiot because he kept stealing the puck at the end of every Stanley Cup <laughs> final game. <laughs> okay. I, I think this question stems from me retweeting the video Saint the Blues put out saying, arguably the greatest defenseman of all time. And all I said was LOL. In his generation. I, and the yeah. video, highlight videos was him getting beat and tripping people. He, uh,. <laughs> He's not in that conversation. No. <laughs> Very good defenseman in his era. You hate to play against him. You can't deny how good he was. Because heart, he, heart trophy because, winner, which isn't nothing for Which is crazy that he won a heart trophy. Yeah. No. Yeah, real son of a bitch. But, that's what he is. And he drank a beer during his uh, re- jersey retirement ceremony, so that's pretty cool. Oh, yeah. Much like Brad Marchand, though, he leaned into it, and I respect that. Um, and it was great to beat him so often. Yes. My most memorable... Uh, Chris Pronger moments when he got suspended for that hit on uh, Thomas Holmstrom. Um, do, 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 what question? Connor Dukes says, just notice that there's kind of a tight race going on. Who ends the season with more points? Rasmussen or Zadina? Currently, Rasmussen has 13. Zadina has 11. If you read that, if you read that out to me in August and said, hey, Ryan, this question, this is going to be a question in January. I would have there would have been some defenestration going on. What if he didn't say the point totals? Just said Rasmussen and Zadina were having a points race. I would have known. <laughs> <laughs> I would have known. <laughs> let's let's all be real here. I can <laughs> I can be nice and fence it and say, oh, we all know how that would go. Uh, I wasn't sad today, but now I am. So thank yeah, you for that. thank you, Connor. Oh my God! And you know what's sadder? My answer is Rasmussen. Zadina only had 10 minutes of ice last game. Yeah, he gets benched for something every game. Um, I'm fully aware that I'm just like neck deep in the sunken cause fallacy here, but it, I'm, I'll go Zadina. I'm going with Rasmussen. He is a bona fide offensive dynamo. 100%. Haven't seen Zadina score a breakaway goal like that. I, I don't even remember the last go- the goal Zadina scored. Was it in November? Probably. Oh, uh, my God. I can't wait until he just breaks, like just gets something. Just one goal again, so it doesn't all feel so. He needs a re. That guy needs a reset more than anyone else in the Red Wings. Uh, Michael Rasmussen's offensive upside says scenario for you. <laughs> Good day. Good day. <laughs> Your Steve Eisenman in Toronto calls asking about Philip Ronick. What does Toronto have to offer for you to say yes? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Trying to remember Toronto system. Sandine would be too much. I don't. I think Toronto would laugh you off the phone. I think you'd have to go picks here. I don't think you're getting a player swap. Amirov, Rodion Amirov, Robertson is asking for a first too much. No. Well, I just basically offered up two first round prospects. I know Robertson wasn't a first round pick, but if that draft were redone, he would be. Amirov plays left wing. He's a four. I don't left know if he wing, plays yeah. left wing, but he's a left shot forward. Yeah. I don't know. I, I, you would have to hope that Hronik's reputation rides a little bit higher than his actual play sometimes. Yes. Much like when Nick Letty gets dealt, it's going to have to be much the same. What are your guys' thoughts on Hosang? He's uh, like on an absolute heater for the Marlies. Detroit could have had him for free at least three well, times Well, that's now. The, the old boys club handshake. Yeah, every time Hosang is waived, it's when teams aren't trying to add contracts. I don't know. I think it's too speculative. Like, yeah, I don't think Hosang has had a great. Well, I wasn't gonna say just for him. No, but as part of the deal. Yeah. Oh, you, yeah. Like, but I don't. I don't even think they'd really want to move him, to be honest. But I mean, the leaves look good. So. 
I hope I hope Toronto comes calling. You saw what they gave up for Nick Foligno. What's going to happen with Hosting is he's going to ride out this year with the Marlies and then probably actually get an NHL contract at the end of the year. Yeah. Just in time. And that's probably what he should want because then he controls his situation a little more. I feel like we've been talking about Josh Hosang for 10 years. What year was he drafted? 2019. 2014. Oh, you're being funny. Oh my God, we've been talking about him for eight years. Harambe was still alive. Don't remind me, man. Everything went downhill when we shot that gorilla. Um, and my daughter was born the next day. <laughs> <laughs> we mean what we said. <laughs> Brad, I hate to tell you this, but we have to bring Mika to the zoo. <laughs> Got a crazy idea that might just work. <laughs> uh, this next comment is from uh, back dash in dash cider uh, 69 it says with the soap opera going on in Edmonton, how long before we see a trade for a goalie and could Grice be up for discussion? Maybe actually I thought, no, there's no way Edmonton is trading for a goalie unless they go big game hunting because the last thing they need is more half decent goalies who are inconsistent. And then I saw one of their potential trade targets was Vili Husso. So, yeah, I'm not ruling anything out here. Yeah, my answer when this was asked, someone asked me this maybe on Twitter a while back. I said, no, there's better options. But it's Edmonton. It's irrational. Ken Holland will finally say we need to do something at goalie but not want to spend anything. He very much has that mentality of I want, but, you know, he wants his cake and to eat it too. Yeah. Mr. The the King of, we need to make a big splash. So here's a third line winger. Here's a bottom pairing defenseman. And here's a backup goalie. And here's Darren Helm returning from injury. Yeah. Um, David Legwan, come on down. It'll come down to the wire. Whoever is dealing the biggest name goalie that they can at the deadline, they'll hold on their price as they should. And then Holland will say, screw it. He'll call Stevie and say, hey, Stevie, can I have Grace for a third or second or something dumb? And Eisman will be like, hey, all right, I'll help out a pal. And meanwhile, Anaheim or pick any random playoff team that will get Semyon Varlamov for less than that somehow. So, yeah, it's a possibility. Yep. Uh, Chad Avina says, if McDavid wants to be traded this summer, what would a realistic trade look like for the Wings? <laughs> Is there a reality where that trade could get done without giving up Larkin, Raymond, or Cider? Absolutely not. None, zero, no chance. It would have to include probably two of them. Yes. At least. If you said right now uh, we could give the entire Red Wings roster to the Oilers for McDavid, I wouldn't immediately say no. <laughs> <laughs> I I think they're – I think that I, – I, I would imagine they would go with Cider Larkin or – it would be Cider something. Cider and one of the other two, and you'd add from there. So now we're the Edmonton Oilers. Pretty, Pretty much. much, yeah. You just reverse spots, kind of. Okay, <laughs> honestly, dumb question, and I want you to actually think about this because I thought this thought crossed my head, and I thought it was stupid until I started thinking about it. If you're Edmonton and we offered Larkin, Raymond, and Sider, do you immediately say yes, or do you actually have to think about that? I'm gonna think about this, but my the first hmm. <laughs> see that's how goddamn good Connor McDavid is. Yeah, it right. Might have to be all fucking three of them, Larkin. Raymond and Sider are all phenomenal players, and if they all reach their peaks, in my mind, well, I mean Larkin is we we know more or less what Larkin his peak at is. his absolute peak, which is a perennial All Star, a top line center, is probably sixty percent of Connor McDavid. He, Connor McDavid is generational in every sense of the word. Yeah, all of those guys could have careers that are worthy of having their numbers in the rafters the first day after they retire, and they still might not sniff how good Connor McDavid is. So yeah, that's. Well, they're not going to sniff that. No, no, they're not. Larkin might end up with his number in the rafters, and he will never be in the same atmosphere as Connor McDavid. And that's not a knock on any of those players. Connor McDavid's a freak from another planet. He was made in a lab on another planet and shipped here. He's the only person who could be... It's, it's almost impossible to answer these questions because he's so good. Look at the Edmonton Oilers roster and the f without McDavid, and then just like keep in mind, this team's not in last place. <laughs> And that sounds like a joke, but legit, if you took McDavid off that team right now, they are probably closer to the the uh, Coyotes and the Canadians than they are to the Red Wings. This is why deals like this are hard they almost don't never to. get done because the value cannot be reached on one side or the other. The calculus is all messed. Up. You can't. Do you know how deep your team would have to be to be able to trade for Connor McDavid and still be competitive? 
you could have a trade where the Red Wings acquire McDavid and hurt themselves long term, right? Yeah. Like it's yeah. the only team that can do this trade is Tampa. Yeah, <laughs> because they have to trade half of their team. Yeah, and they'll still have two superstars and a good defense core to you know support McDavid when he gets there. Oh, I'm glad I'm not a GM right now. Well, actually, no, I don't think this is really an option for the GMs. Um, we're going to finish off with a question from Cody Stark that I think is funny. It says, my friends are being responsible adults since they just had their first child. They're making a will, you know, just in case they kick the bucket. Uh, they're leaving me their cat. What would each of you leave each other in your own wills? I got, <laughs> I got dibs on Evan's hot tub. Um, for context, Evan is a cat guy and not a dog guy, as he's told me. My dog, Abby, senses this. And she loves she loves Brad, like loves Brad. Is so excited when he comes over. But she loves Evan. Like immediately will sprint to him, sit on his feet, and make him pet her as long as she can manage. And Evan, for someone who's not a dog guy, sure loves Abby. So I'm an animal whisperer. Catherine yeah. hates it because Alfie has been like her cat. Like he's 16, and now Alfie is my cat, not hers, <laughs> and she hates it. So if uh, if Mel and I, you know, go over the side of a cliff, I'm leaving Abby to you because I think that's funny. I will take on the big sausage. Well, that's not going to get clipped at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not going to get clipped. Zero all. chance I'm editing that out. Uh, well, I'll live with that. Yeah. I think, uh, Peter, this is your territory where you're clipping these. <laughs> Brad, what are you leaving in your will? Um... I'll leave Evan my shitty laptop because that would stress him the hell out. And I'll leave you Hank and Mika because that will stress you the hell out. You're an asshole. I would leave you. What would I leave you? Hmm. I don't know. I'd have to think about that one. The squat rack, please. Yeah, you can have the, <laughs> you can, you can have the squat rack. Awesome. Um, Mysterious accents may befall you. <laughs> Ryan, you can have my computer because Brad will never appreciate it. No, he won't. Um, I'd use it twice a week at most. Oh man, I got so many things I could leave. Brad, just neither you're left handed, right? Like no. golf? Ah, well, that doesn't no. work. I'm ready. Brad could use the cat litter, like the used cat litter. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I don't know. You can either have my TV or my hot tub. Oh, hold on. Your computer is great, but you're. Yeah, but first thing, I need you to take my computer and destroy the hard drive, so delete the history, <laughs> and then you can have everything else. This is not just a monetary it, thing. It's it a... comes with work, yeah. yeah. I got a job. See, yeah. See that's why I'm going to take the TV, because I know the work that goes into that hot tub. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll take the hot tub. Yeah. All right, uh, on that ridiculous that. And I'm, I am not building a f***ing hot tub pad. No, <laughs> not going through that again. Listening to it was hard enough. It's worse than prison. <laughs> No, I don't think so. I would know. You would. We call him Prison Evan. We're going to end this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast and thank all of our listeners. Um, we're going to thank the episode of, or thank the episode. Thank the sponsors for this episode, the FanDuel Sportsbook, and our name level sponsors on Patreon. Arjun Shanker, Eves Bartels on behalf of the Sarah Grand Foundation, Kyle Kragitz, Nick Perks, Brett Bailey, Terry, driver of the number 69, Crying Ryan, Hannah's Banana Slam and Jamathong, Taylor Tagel, Matthew M. Rice, B. Diz, Carl Brutana Nanaluski, Chimmy, Citizen High Five, CJ Sully, Craig Kibble, Derek Enstam, DJ Denton, Give Blood, Fight Probert, Greech, Hana Lee, Hassam al Qasem, Jay Gollum, Jacob Turner, Justin and the Angry Mob, Kaylin Wood, King Tone, Kyle Hashman, Matt McKay, R.A., Ryan Hubbard, Scott Martin, Stay Fresh Cheese Bags, uh, your friendly neighborhood win <laughs> window peeper, Zach Spring, <laughs> Zarly Zalapsky, Andrew Bohan, Sam Bankson, Adam, I wish I could finish like Ernie. After Tuesday, even the calendar says WTF, Antonio Gracias, Babe Landiscog, Ben Barron, Connor Leighton, Dave W., Eric Sinkowski, Evans Spicy Rum Chata Boof, Evans Bingo Card, Goose Egg Ned, James Laporte, Jeremy Brocker, John Evans, Josh Yelton, Kev Kevin McCracken, Quaz, Logan Stull, Matt Keeler, Matt S., Max $1 million, Revy DeLuca, Terry Actual, Trevor Pevavar, Zach Handyside, and Zach McCann, a driving range superstar. Thank you all so much, and we will see you on Sunday.
Thanks for tuning in to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Be sure to check out wingedwheelpodcast.com where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll also find links to other ways to support the show, such as Patreon, official podcast apparel, and more. And don't forget to follow the show on Twitter at Winged Wheel Pod. And of course, the hosts at Brad Crisco, at Ryan Hanna WWP, and at Hockey Town Evan.